they say threatens their sovereignty and reduces water and environmental protections. But Harper's administration claims that these acts are beneficial. So we contacted the office of John Duncan, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development, and while they declined our request to appear on the program, they stated that working together remains the best way to achieve our shared objective of healthier, more prosperous, and self-sufficient First Nation communities. Our government remains committed to working with those Aboriginal leaders who want to work with the Government of Canada to create jobs and growth in their communities. So, the government claims these new laws help the indigenous community. Native people say that's just not the case. But how then do they take their movement forward? And with rumors of growing internal divisions, will Idle No More lose momentum? We have a full Google Hangout today to jump into this discussion. Ellen Gabriel is an indigenous activist joining us from near Montreal, Quebec. With us from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan is Erica Lee, Idle No More's Facebook page manager. Jarrett Martineau is a community organizer for the Idle No More movement, and he joins us from Victoria, British Columbia. And with us from Edmonton, Alberta, is Tanya Capo of the Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation. She is one of the first people to use the Idle No More hashtag, which has been mentioned more than 260,000 times since November. I do want to mention our entire panel is from Canada's Indigenous community. So, welcome to the stream, everyone. Wab, I want to start with you. Explain sure. to people a little bit about why this issue is dividing Canadians. Well, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, confusing why it's dividing Canadians because at its heart, I don't know more, is about environmental and social justice. And these are things that the majority of Canadians agree with. The thing that uh, causes divisions is because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what it is that indigenous people in Canada are asking for, especially when you get into things like honor the treaties, uh, you know, uh, respect indigenous rights. I think a lot of Canadians start to think, whoa, hang on, what does that mean? Does that mean that I'm going to have to pay higher taxes? Does that mean that I'm going to have to give up my dream home in the suburbs in order to fulfill some sort of land claim or treaty obligation? But I think uh, Canadians would do well to understand that that's not really the case. This is not a situation where Indigenous people are demanding uh, reparations at their expense, but rather a situation where Indigenous people want to be included in the way forward and yet to still have the chance to honour their heritage, our heritage, which is to say we still want to have that treaty and constitutional protection that allows us to continue on our way of life. Now when you broaden it out into a global perspective and you ask why does I don't know more matter to people beyond the borders within Canada, well there's a 650 billion dollar reason why this matters. The government of Canada estimates that there's 650 billion dollars worth of natural resources to be developed in our country within the next decade. Steel, diamonds, oil, gasoline, all these things that are needed to drive the global economy. In Canada, in our Constitution, there's a clause called Section 35, which recognizes and affirms Aboriginal and treaty rights. Mm -hmm. Cut through the legalese, what it means is that we have to talk. The Government of Canada, if it wants to develop natural resources, has a duty to consult with Indigenous people, has a duty to consult with what are referred to as Native Americans here in the States. So for the global audience, they should be looking at I don't know more and, w and, and seeing this as a challenge to that uh, legal authority to develop the natural resources within Canada. So, Ellen, here's one of the problems, though. The global audience and much of the audience in Canada is keying in more to these misconceptions that WAB is talking about. Uh, you know, J28 was yesterday, and while you guys had some good ramp up with media coverage, you've had some good social media coverage, you know, we were following the numbers today. The tweets have gone down. The, the Facebook... Uh, connections have gone down with regard to this movement. Are you concerned that these misconceptions uh, among Canadians and elsewhere are uh, going to slow down the movement and possibly derail it? No, I don't, I don't think we can derail a movement that's been going uh, on for, you know, I would say uh, a few centuries. Uh, and it's, it's peaking at this point because we have uh, social media. This is one of the tools that I wish we had had during the Oka crisis because social media has been allowing us to continue to educate. And, and yes, it's, you know, we, we all have jobs, we all work. So there's going to be a lull. But I think what the important thing to remember is, is that we need to continue the education and we need to keep sustaining uh, the fact that this is, it's called idle no more, but it's really about uh, justice, freedom, uh, and calling to task a government that does not respect the rule of law has their buddies in the corporations uh, 
uh, best interests at heart and not democracy and, and to really bring about the human rights aspect uh, of, of that has been underneath all of the issues that we are talking about, the human rights and the environmental rights. And I think Idle No More will continue. If it fails, then, then we ourselves allow it to fail. And I don't think we want that. Well, along the same lines, our community is defining this for themselves. Nora says, I don't know more is a civil rights movement. Until we have justice for all, people will continue to struggle against our racist system. But Jared Martineau in our Google Plus Hangout, I'd like you to address this next one. Data Tax says, the Harper CPC omnibus bill, C45, is the modern day equivalent to handing out smallpox contaminated blankets. Now, this is a, a term that has been bandied around a lot online. Can you explain what this bill is to our uninitiated? Uh, well, the Bill C-45 is one among many, and I'm probably actually the, maybe one of the less qualified people on our panel today. Certainly, um, I know Tanya has a lot of uh, a lot more experience relative to the legislation, but the broad view is that uh, Bill C-45, Bill C-38, as large pieces of omnibus legislation, and uh, a lot of other bills that are being pushed forward by the Harper government are doing their best to erode, especially environmental protections. Uh, along with a variety of other changes that are going to severely impact uh, Canada's indigenous populations and in ways that people are relating to the ongoing process of colonialism that's been a part of our lives and our nations since the time of first contact. And so I think what people are resistant to is the fact that a lot of these changes are being forced on us without proper consultation to our communities and to our nations. And uh, we're, we haven't been not only included in that process, but we're going to be severely impacted in ways that uh, leave us in a continually disadvantaged position. And that's that's a part of this movement. It's certainly not the only point of focus, but it's definitely uh, been a, a huge part of it. Well, there are people that argue that the movement has lost its way, that there are internal divisions that are preventing it from moving forward as a powerful, cohesive force. How do you respond to them? Well, I think any time that there's, a, there, there's a, a movement that's based in social media, it, it has a diffuse nature. There's no one figurehead, there's no one leader who well, calls the shots. It's not just social shots. media, though. It's 600 plus indigenous oh, yeah. communities in Canada with yeah, leaders absolutely. and governments. And so I, the point that I would make is this, is that, you know, when you organize on social media or when you organize a group with such a diverse cultural heritage as, you know, the, the, the combined uh, in, indigenous nations within Canada, you're dealing with many voices. But the thing is, that's what democracy is. That's it's what I gathering, Wall Street was gathering, there too, right? Yeah, no, but no it's about unity, gathering about all these voices. voices together and then trying to afford a common direction forward out of it. So what I would say, uh, the optimistic uh, person in me, is, is that what we're witnessing right now with all these divisions playing out, with people expressing their objections to certain courses of action that are taking place within the movement, is that we are in the process, uh, somewhat rancorous, somewhat noisy process, of building that common direction forward. So yes, right now it looks messy, but over the coming weeks and months, I believe that people are going to continue harnessing the energy that Idle No More has unleashed so far and trying to smooth How? out those divisions. How do you do that without a single or a small number of figureheads that are defining the pathway forward? This is the way that our people govern themselves in traditional times pr prior to uh, contact. We build consensus by hearing the voices of all community members, women, elders, young people, and then the leaders who went out were not leaders who called the shots, but just spokespeople for the direction that had been sent by the community. So if we're smart about this and we manage to harness some consensus building process using a combination of social media and uh, you know uh, meetings in uh, the real world, we actually have the chance to sort of rebuild those traditional governance systems that have been eroded over the years since uh, the Indian Act and other forms of legislation in Canada impacted our communities. Well, Tanya, I'd like you to follow up on this, Tanya, in our Google Plus Hangout. Uh, there's a tweet here from Samantha, and she says, Canada has the duty to consult with Canada's indigenous in order to develop and use natural resources. And this, of course, is something that we heard a little bit earlier in the show. I'd like you to elaborate that, on that and let us know what Canada's First Nations leaders are doing. Okay, can I just first go back a little bit to the uh, comments about the smallpox blankets and, and how Bill C-45 has sort of been compared to it. that? Because I, I think that's an important um, thing to think about because when blankets are given to First Nations people, they did not know that they were infested with the smallpox virus. And the blankets were given to them as a gift in a way that was supposed to offer them protection and warmth. And I think if you look back to the earlier comments about Bill C-45 that you received from the minister's office that talk about how this legislation is supposed to be um, for the economic benefit of First Nations people and participation in the economy, that's the same kind of parallel. 
they're putting in these changes with this whole premise that it's for our best interest when really it isn't it, it, it's the changes to Bill C-45 allow greater access to what Indian lands are left and protected through the Indian Act, as well as access to the waters, the bodies of waters, the rivers and lakes. So while the government of Canada puts forth this idea that this is for the benefit of the Canadian economy, and in particular First Nations people, that's part of that whole premise of we're doing what's right for them, but really it's not. A lot of blame has been placed on the federal government for many things, including living conditions of the indigenous. But then there are also those within the community who blame themselves. Um, we found this in the comments section of an article explaining the Idle No More movement, where one person said, yes, the government is responsible for many atrocities, but over time, we've become our own worst enemies. It's all about choices and chances. It's your choice to stay in the res rut. You don't like it? Do something about it. Stop relying on government to fix us. Stop being a victim. Stop the dysfunctional, banned politics and infighting. What about this idea of self-determination, Wab? Has that somehow lost its way in all of this? I think uh, an important part of the Idle No More movement is that we're walking our culture back into the national collective conscious of Canada. And what you're seeing is that there are solutions coming from Indigenous communities in Canada. People are, you know, uh, revitalizing education. People are working towards uh, revitalizing the language. People are trying to create economic development opportunities in their own backyards, create jobs and things like that. So. Part of the movement is to cast light onto that, to start sharing the success stories that we have in, in our communities. Unfortunately, it makes for worse headlines than a blockade. So that doesn't get the same sort of media attention. But that is happening. People are talking. People are saying, this is what we're doing over here. Here's how you could do it in your own backyard. Here's what we're finding success with. So I definitely, I hear what that commenter is saying. I think it's very important for us to recognize that at the end of the day, the solutions that we seek are not going to come from politicians. The solutions are going to come from ourselves. The only people who are invested enough to make the long-term uh, you know, time commitment to turn things around in our communities is our own people, right? We're the ones left holding the bag at the end of the day. So we have to do that. But that, being true, doesn't mean that we can let uh, the other people off the hook. For sure, the politicians have a role to play. The different levels of government in Canada have a role to play. What I would like to see happen with the I Don't Know More energizing so many people in uh, Canada is to have Aboriginal people stand up and start you know, walking the talk around sovereignty. We want to be nations, okay, let's do that. Let's, be pra let, let's put that into practice and then we look at the, uh, uh, the relationship with the federal government, the provincial governments at the same time. So like any relationship, it's a two-way street. We need to do things, the different uh, levels of Canadian society need to do things as well. don't mean to cut you off, but I want to talk no. about some of the obstacles towards doing that. Erica Lee in our Google Plus Hangout, I'd like to direct this to you. Uh, in, in, in the post that Lisa read a little bit earlier, uh, the last line of it said, stop being a victim. Um, and I wonder what you're seeing online, of course, as a Facebook manager for I Don't Know More campaign. Uh, we're seeing things like this from UCS Panther, and this is a comment left on uh, a YouTube video. Pack of beggars and parasites. Uh, there's another one here. Natives should take their issues to their forefathers. It was their forefathers who sold them out for cheap whiskey. So we're seeing things that, of course, definitely smack of racism. What are you seeing? Um, I see a lot of those comments on the Facebook page, but um, it's important, you know, to take the negative with the positive. Um, on a Facebook page, you're going to get a very polarizing attitude. You're going to get the people who support you, and you're going to get the trolls. Um, I think Redneck Boy or whatever his name was is one of them. Um, but uh, for me, those kind of messages motivate me because for me, I don't know more is about education. It's about informing people about the history that we're still living with today as indigenous peoples. Even as a 22 year old, I still face racism. I still face boundary, uh, barriers in, in schooling and in education, in, in poverty and racism. It's not ancient history, and that's one of the most important things that we have to broadcast as um, I don't know more. Ellen, though, th this is an important issue when we're talking about violence against women and racism against these indigenous communities. Do you feel like there's a security risk for indigenous peoples who are protesting and who are standing up? Yeah, I think that we've seen a few examples of people who have not respected the protesters and the police themselves being part to blame because they haven't blocked the roads properly. But if we go back to the, the issue of the woman who was raped in Thunder Bay by two uh, white men, and she was told that they had done this before, and this is what Aboriginal people deserve, 
We know that Amnesty International themselves have documented through their Stolen Sisters report from 2004 and so on. The UN has also asked Canada to have a national plan of action uh, in regards to dealing with the, the issue of murdered and missing uh, Indigenous women. Nothing is being done because it all comes down to whether the Treasury Board thinks it's going to be of economic benefit to our communities. So this is the kind of attitude that we are dealing with the government of Canada. And yes, very much, I, I do believe that our safety is at risk because we do have a lot of people who uh, don't know the issues, who base it, base it on racist stereotypes uh, and, and think because their government is, in, is silent and condoning and saying nothing about these racist acts, that it's, it's okay to do it. And Amnesty has said that. In the, in, in, Aboriginal women in Canada are the most vulnerable and marginalized because uh, the authorities have la allowed perpetrators to do these kinds of actions against us with impunity. So, Jarrett, how do you change the historical narrative then that creates this kind of, of, of racism? I mean, there's a belief that Indigenous people are a problem. How do you shift that belief? Well, I think, I mean, as we've seen, obviously, this has only been going on for, I mean, this particular part of the movement in terms of Idle No More has only been going on for a couple of months, and we've seen the kind of racism that's come out as a result of that. I think that we're in the midst of a longer process of uh, mutual re-education on what the history and the current state of our people is. I think that trying to address colonialism is a very, very big project that involves all of us. And I think, as Wab said, I mean, this is about trying to repair relationships on both sides of the equation, so it requires it uh, requires work on the Indigenous community level, it requires work in relationship to government, and it absolutely requires that process to be engaged by the non-native population of Canada. And I think that um, that mutual re-education work also requires a voluntary participation of people to confront their own ways in which they've benefited from the historical realities of uh, colonial oppression. And, and that means that um, it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of patience and it's going to take overcoming the kinds of stereotypes that stand in the way. And I think that any time when you know you look at historical civil rights movements and other movements for justice when what you're calling out is if not a legacy but an ongoing in our case continued reality of that form of oppression and racism when you're calling out the other side for the ways in which it benefits from that there's going to be a lot of pushback there's going to be a lot of resistance because people don't want to believe that they're a part of the problem everybody wants to believe that we're all part of the nice system that's well functioning but you know, I don't know more has said, look, the status quo is not working for our people. It's not working for Canada. And in order for us, all of us to have a better relationship, we need to be in this together and work a lot more hard than we have been. Well, and looking forward, Webb, there's a tweet here from Mikey. He says, is there a combined Native Congress to unify the voices of Idle No More to make it more cohesive and less divided? Well, right now there is a national organization called the Assembly of First Nations, which is part of the origin of all the uh, conflict that's playing out in the media is because there's a, a power struggle going on within that organization. But, you know, the Assembly of First Nations itself is a little bit, uh, you know, flawed as being the mouthpiece of uh, Canada's Indigenous people for two reasons. One, it's the elected band officials who vote in the national chief, not the people of the communities. And two, because they only represent the people who live on reserves. They don't represent the majority of the population who live in the urban centers of Canada. So definitely, I think that there is an opportunity for us to come together and create uh, a new national platform that speaks to the issues that matter to Indigenous uh, people in Canada. And what I would like to see happen is for the, 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 the leaders who have emerged within Idle No More, some of whom you see in the Google Hangout right there, Tanya Capo, Ellen Gabriel, Jared Martineau, you know what I mean? To have some of these voices stand up and start the process of, you know, codifying this and putting in a, 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 a little bit more of an organizational structure into Idle No More so that we can eliminate all this talk of like, oh, what do they really want? What, what are they really asking for? And then we can lay out a, like a, a plan, whether it's a four point, 10 point, eight point plan, whatever. We just laid out, here's what we're talking about. Here is the people that you can go talk to. And then we, we reach out to the grassroots and we, we say, you know, this is the way forward that we are proposing is going to make real change for the kids in our communities. And then we ask the people to come in and, and, and stand behind that. And I mean, like for us, this is not some abstract, you know, discussion about treatment rights this is not something pie in the sky last night you know I lost a relative to suicide you know this continues on and on and it's not like we can say oh that beautiful young girl that I grew up with is dead because of the Indian Act but at the same time we can't throw up our hands and say that they are not related all these challenges that our people face, whether it's suicide, whether it's oppression, whether it's the Indian Act, whether it's lack of educational opportunities, they're all related. What Idle No More is saying is now is the time for Indigenous people to stand up and assert 
our own control over our own destiny and to reach out to our allies both within Canada and around the globe All to right. say stand with us. Well, I'm going to pause you there. We're going to put this conversation on hold, so please join us in the post show in a few minutes. But uh, first, Malika's got a few other leads we're following.